Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tatiana Regovna. Yes, okay. Let's wait just for several minutes and we will start. Раз, два, раз. Виктория, а я могу экраном делиться? То есть вы дали эту опцию? Все так да. Okay, uh, dear colleagues, uh, hello, my name is Alexander Maltsev. It gives me uh, an immense pleasure to warmly welcome you uh, to our conference. Uh, it's uh, a great honor for me uh, to head this session. Uh, the informal motto of our conference uh, is uh, economics in hard times. Uh, actually, it's a paraphrase of the title of the book written by two remarkable scholars, Banerjee and Duflor, uh, Good Economics uh, for Hard Times. Uh, I think that uh, few will argue that our conference is taking place in rather grim era. Uh, some experts even try to convince us uh, that uh, we could be living uh, in the days of the new clash of civilizations. Uh, and uh, I, I think that in this regard, it's crucial to make contacts with international colleagues uh, to communicate with them and to understand each other. Uh, that's why I am uh, infinitely pleased that such outstanding scholars as Professor Cunha, Hageman, Orwood, uh, have agreed to participate in our conference at uh, this uh, uneasy time. I think that uh, in their presentations, our uh, great colleagues will show how different political experiments of the past affected the development of uh, economic sciences uh, in different countries of the world. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that nowadays, this experience have acquired um, a new meaning uh, and is very instructive for modern Russian scholars. Uh, I also have to say that uh, Mm, uh, some words about the speaking time. Of course, I would like uh, to listen to the participants of our session uh, endlessly, but of course we should respect uh, uh, the schedule. So the total time for each presentation is about 15 minutes and uh, probably seven minutes for discussion. Uh, and uh, now I would like to give floor uh, to the first speaker, Professor Cunha, uh, you're welcome. Uh, you have uh, 15 minutes, please. Thank you so much, Alexander. Uh, can I share with you? Uh, yes, uh, just a moment. Yes, I think now you can. Okay, uh, just a moment. Oh, come on. Uh, it's a uh, green button, yes, here. Uh, very yeah. traditional, I think. Actually. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, so just a minute. I, I need to, to leave and re enter. Oh. Okay. Okay, now again. Yes. <laughs> I think you have the possibility. Yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> Are you seeing? Yes. Okay. Everything is fine. So uh, this one. Still not fine. Don't worry, I'm counting my time. <laughs> <laughs> we will give you some uh, several extra minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Now I think that will work. Uh, so yes, uh, my my goal here today is is to talk about uh, Celso Furtado uh, in this this specific moment of of his of his life of his career, which is the the period that he he was exiled from 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 Brazil. He stayed exiled from. Brazil uh, from 64 to 78, uh, basically. Uh, as you know, uh, Celso Furtado is one of the most preeminent Latin American economists in the 20th century. And, and he's, he's known both for his, his uh, policy work, creating institutions in, in, in Brazil and also uh, in, in his work at Cepal and also for his academic work, theorizing uh, the evolution of, of Latin American economies. And, and uh, prior to, to his, <clears throat> to, to the, the 64 uh, coup d'etat in Brazil uh, that started a military uh, dictatorship, uh, Furtado uh, had been uh, uh, director of the, the Sudeni, the uh, uh, government agents that had been found in, in the 60s uh, by him, uh, which promoted a, a very innovative uh, regional economic development uh, program in, in Brazil and in the northeastern part of Brazil. Uh, and he was also minister of planning of the deposed, uh, deposed government. Uh, just to, to give you a, a brief, uh, brief idea of, of Furtado's intellectual trajectory, uh, we, we can talk about uh, his, his academic formation from the 39 to 48. Uh, from 49 to 57 is the period that he was uh, in Cepal, in, in Chile, uh, the, the, the Economic Commission, the UN Economic Commission for Latin America. And uh, the, from 58 to 64 is, is the period that he had uh, several different and important positions in the Brazilian government. And uh, from 64 to 80, 85 uh, actually was the period where he had this academic career in the exile, uh, in exile, uh, first in Chile, then in the US, and for the most part of the time in Paris as professor of economics at the Sorbonne. Uh, actually, uh, he, uh, from, from 64, Four to seventy-eight was the the formal period of 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 the exile because he was he had his political rights revoked by the military government, and and this revocation uh, stands until seventy-eight. Uh, so after uh, seventy-eight, he started to 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 return frequently to Brazil. So we can talk. Uh, he still lived in in, in Paris until 85, uh, but, but the period, the proper period of the exile was from 64 to 78. Uh, I will talk today also about uh, two specific moments, most about the second one, uh, which I consider was, were uh, important points of inflection in, 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 in Furtado's career, which were, uh, uh, two uh, sabbatical years that he spent in Cambridge, in, uh, at, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and the second one from 73 to 74 were actually very important in terms of some redefinitions of, of his understanding of, of, of development, connecting development to culture, uh, as I will tell you uh, in a few moments. Uh, so, let me uh, explain this briefly. Uh, uh, I, I, I think that it is a, a very interesting moment in, in his career, a very dynamic one. And we can talk longly about a sequence of, of different book, books during the 70s. But uh, to make it brief and to, to establish this connection with 
this uh, this sabbatical year in Cambridge, uh, I think that is in interesting to start with two uh, discussion papers published by the Cambridge's Center of Latin American Studies uh, in 73, which were very important for these redefinitions that I'm talking about, uh, Furtado's ideas on development. Uh, <clears throat> the first one, under development and dependence, the fundamental connection, uh, it's the one where he presented uh, his ideas that will be later explored in, in a book uh, called, uh, it was published in English as Accumulation and Development, uh, but it, it, the original title in Portuguese is Criatividade e Dependência, Creativity and Dependence. Uh, but but it, I, I will use both titles just to, 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 uh, to the sake of, of clarity. Uh, it is uh, not possible to, to properly understand the, the, the dynamic of underdevelopment according to Furtado uh, in this, this, this text without examining the process of production, which is conducted using important technology through important substitution industrialization together with a process of circulation, which is dictated by examining, uh, expanding patterns of consumption to emulate those of rich countries. So in this moment, Furtad was actually uh, moving to an understanding of underdevelopment, including a high degree of cultural dependence related to the reproduction of uh, uh, patterns of consumption of the rich countries. And this will be the, 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 the core of his uh, reasoning at this, at this moment. Uh, so uh, the consequence of, of this process would be explored in, in another uh, paper published in 73, also as the result of, of, of these discussions uh, that he had and during this, this, this year, this sabbatical year in, in Cambridge, which is uh, the myth of economic development and the future of the third world, uh, which would be expanded as, as a, a book in 74, uh, and in this, this, this paper, and also in the, in the book, what we can see is an understanding of, of, of uh, economic development as a, a, a reproduction of the process of industrialization of, of rich countries through the, develop, the underdevelopment, underdeveloped world uh, as an illusion. So one hand, uh, this widespread process would be impossible uh, given the natural resource required and the subsequent environment impact. So it, it's, a, it's a very new discussion connected to, to, uh, to uh, in, uh, important topics at, at that moment, I can ex explain later. Uh, but on the other hand, industrialization by, is by nature distinct in underdeveloped areas and thus incapable of providing the same gains in well-being. So again, he, he, he started to talk at this moment about this, this the, 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 the problem of the reproduction of the consumption patterns. Uh, and, and the connection with, with, with culture is, uh, uh, is that, uh, well, Furtado started to talk about cultural change in the 50s, but at this moment, uh, the novelty will be that he will uh, understand the technological dependence as a kind of cultural dependence and will theorize about, about it. Uh, so uh, we, we have a, a, an important contribution also to the debate on dependence at this moment. Uh, Furtado was, was criticized by other authors of the so-called uh, dependency school in the late 60s. Uh, so this, this, this book, uh, these different books in, in the 70s was also uh, 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 his answer to, to this uh, criticisms and his contribution to this, to this debate. 
And so culture as defined by Furtado uh, would be a critical uh, aspect to understand uh, how uh, capital accumulation and economic growth were unable to overcome the barriers created by concentrated income distribution in the context of underdeveloped. Uh, let me just move, I have uh, four to five minutes, maximum three, maybe. <laughs> So uh, uh, let me skip some parts here and go to, to the core of the creativity and independence, this, this book that I mentioned. Uh, as I said, uh, this, 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 uh, this is a, 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 an attempt to connect uh, the proper development, the true development uh, with culture as part of a, a broader strategy to widening the view of the social context and its dynamics. Uh, and, and here, Furtado is interested uh, in, in understand, as I also, as I said, uh, technological dependence as a cultural dependence. And, and, and he was doing this, uh, showing how this reproduction of patterns of consum, of consum uh, 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 make uh, a specific dynamic in terms of, of the reproduction of technological patterns in uh, the industrialization. And uh, just to finish, this, this, this book is also very important because he has a, a strong criticism, he, he presents a strong criticism about uh, the, 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 the political aspects of uh, that conditionated the, the, the development and, and including uh, to live in, in authoritarian government. Uh, so uh, I, I select two, two interesting uh, excerpts from this book, Accumulation and Development. The first one is authoritarianism is a repressive weapon of the social forces that dependent industrialization failed to channel in a constructive way. If development is the expression of the capacity to create original solutions to the specific problems of a society, authoritarianism, on the other hand, by blocking the social process in which this creativity is feed, uh, frustrates true development. And, and the other one, uh, if creativity is freedom, so this is one of the important connections that he, he, he made in this book, uh, creativity and freedom as important tools for the development. Uh, in our times, the only authentic form of freedom that exists is political freedom. Hence, the destruction of political freedom, freedom engenders that specific phenomenon of this century that is totalitarianism. It is exactly from this side that the most threatening winds blow. The insecurity that manifests itself on a personal level has its origin in an economic instability that is global. Nevertheless, the concentration of power is always justified in terms of greater security for individuals. So uh, to conclude, uh, this is, is, is very interesting because we can see here Furtado reflecting about uh, different aspects of development, connecting it to uh, cultural aspects uh, in the moment that the, the, the debate on the discipline on, on economic developments was declining in the mid 70s. Uh, but it's also a, a, a moment of, of strong criticism of the military dictatorship, dictatorship in Brazil, uh, revealing uh, the mechanisms by which the absence of freedom uh, completely frustrates true development. So that's it. I think that I stay in my 15 minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, it's a really very insightful presentation. And uh, uh, if uh, other colleagues don't mind, I will start with the following question. Yes, uh, uh, as we can see, yes, uh, these uh, ideas, uh, Furtado's uh, ideas are 
really visionary, but uh, do they still um, exist uh, in uh, Brazilian economic discourse, uh, uh, how they coexist uh, with uh, mainstream uh, economics? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that's a very, a very interesting and important question. Uh, I, I can say that, that, that it still exists because, uh, because uh, Brazil is, 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 uh, is, is one country where the, 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 the place for heterodoxy in the economic debate is, is, still, is still important. So we have we have in the top centers of, of, of graduate studies in Brazil, uh, we have uh, main, mainly uh, mainstream uh, uh, economics, but, but my center is one of, of the top, uh, the top uh, postgraduate centers in Brazil. And it's a, it's a good example of, 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 uh, of plural, pluralism, I would say, a, a combination of, of, of Development economics in this tradition of 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 Celso Furtado and other authors, uh, also with with mainstream economics. So, uh, for the understanding of of, of key topics like uh, inequality, for example, uh, you have you have interesting uh, combinations uh, in the studies nowadays in Brazil. Uh, in academia, I mean, uh, not in the government. <laughs> uh, uh, related to 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 the debate of of of, of uh, development economics in this this tradition of Furtado, with uh, with uh, mainstream economics, for example, uh, multidimensional uh, uh, reasonings about uh, about how to 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 do with poverty reduction and that kind of thing. Uh, but j just to 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 give you a, a very brief idea, but but I would say that 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 the debate is still is still going on in in development economics in Brazil, in this Thank field, you. in this tradition. Yes, uh, I see the hand. Yes, Professor Horvat. Yes, please, <laughs> uh, uh, Alex uh, Alessandro. Uh, I grew up as a teenager in Czechoslovakia, and we all read Jorge Amado. Uh -huh. <laughs> because that was very much translated into Slovak, into Czech. And I think he was maybe not a very similar story, but in an extent similar story to Furtado. So was there this cooperation among, you know, economists, other type of intellectuals, uh, like in the literature mm -hmm. or other? That's a question. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Yulis. Uh, and 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 glad to know that you read uh, George Amado. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a fantastic novelist. Uh, and and well, I can say that for for uh, uh, for someone like Furtado, this 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 collaboration was was actually intense because uh, because Furtado was that kind of of very uh, broad intellectual with broad interests. I mean. Uh, and and even even living in in France during this this period, uh, he was in contact with uh, a, a a number of 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 in Brazilian intellectuals, uh, both in exile and also the ones that stayed in Brazil. Uh, and and this this book in particular, this creativity and dependence, is a, a very interesting book because it's a book that combined also uh this this reasoning about the importance of of the artistic field the culture in general and 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 the creativity in general uh, as tools for uh the 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 development the the true development as 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 he said which means is not only a question of uh of uh as in modern terms, again, poverty reduction is a, is a is a is a question of transforming the society, and for this you need to 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 have a, a, a much more uh, broad uh, uh, understanding of 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 the of the world. So uh, yes, I, I can say that the, the the interaction was was intense with different intellectuals at that moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Victoria. Are there any questions uh, from uh, our offline participants? No question. Yes, uh, probably uh, 
may I ask one uh, more <laughs> question? Yes, very brief one. Uh, probably I'm wrong, but uh, of course, uh, please correct me. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Furtada uh, has changed his views about economic growth in uh, 1980s, yes? Uh, uh, probably he switched his attention to some uh, environmental issues. Uh, am I right? Uh, uh, well, actually he, he was this, I don't know what exactly, you, what, what are you saying, but, uh, but uh, he, he, he changed partially his views during the 70s, during this During the 70s, that, yes. That, that I, I, am, uh, uh, I am talking today, uh, specifically because, uh, uh, but not, not only because of environmental questions. So one of the things that, that he was saying is that uh, the, the, the development, uh, you, you have constraints to the development related to environmental mm. questions, but this is not the main constraint uh, for him in this book, in this myth of, 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 of development. Uh, he was actually saying that, that uh, the, uh, the, the main constraint is not, it's not an environ, environmental one. The main constraint is related to the reproduction of the patterns of consumptions of, of the of the rich countries. Uh, so uh, 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 that that is in, in a short, in short, uh, this is this is his main contribution in in this book. But yes, he was he he changed uh, partially his views about development in comparison with the ones that he formulated in, originally in the fifties. In the 50s and 60s. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Yes, thank you very much once again for a very, very interesting presentation. And now uh, I think it's high time to give floor to Professor Hageman. Uh, Harald, thank you. Bye -bye. Yes, uh, Hello, You're still in getting, Alessandra? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Not in okay. Yeah. Uh, my topic is isolation and brain drain, two sides of the same coin. Now, in the 1990s, we had a very lively and controversial debate among European economists on the independence of European economic thought, as well as about the similarities and differences between American and European economics. Some went as far as to pose the question, is there still any European economics left? Mm -hmm. Now, this happened against the background of the development of economics as an academic discipline after the, the end of the Second World War, which was marked by an increasing internationalization that was simultaneously in large part a process of Americanization and also of homogenization. So mathematization, econometrization, and many different national traditions and styles got more or less lost, including a stronger integration of economics with other social sciences. And uh, Richard Portis, who was a very influential economist based in London at the time, came to the conclusion it is perfectly reasonable to ask whether there is now any economics outside and independent of the United States. All the data confirm American leadership. His analysis of the dominance of American economics uh, took as indicators, for example, the high percentage of American Nobel Prize winners. You may say this is a regional prize, more or less, if one looks at the distribution of this prize. I think 57 out of 75 uh, recipients so far got this uh, prize. The leading scholarly journals, they are all based in the United States, those with the highest impact factor, and the origin of most of the influential ideas which were new after the Second World War. Now, at the same time, Paul Samuelson, who was probably the best known leading individual economist in the world, and who was the first who got the Bank of Sweden prize in memory of Alfred Nobel in economic science, which is not a genuine Nobel Prize, uh, made the statement in a prominent article, quotation, the triumphant rise of American economics 
after 1940 was enormously accelerated by importation of scholars from Hitlerian Europe. I may add not only at this place and Stalinist Europe, so which at a certain time in the Second World War covered more or less almost 90% of European areas. So also from smaller countries, which were invaded by either German or Russian troops, many scholars left for the United States where most of them ended up. Now, uh, this had the consequence of a great loss, not only in economics, also in other sciences, uh, of the influence of Russian and German and partly Italian scholars at the time. Also a loss particularly of German as an international language in science. Now, uh, among the Nobel Prize winners, you find some of Russian origins, like you all know, Simon Kastnets or Vasily Leontiev. They are also dealt with in this new book, which came out just uh, a few weeks ago, edited by Vladimir Avtonomov and me on Russian and Western economic thought, mutual influences and transfer of ideas, on which probably tomorrow Vladimir will say some words because I cannot participate tomorrow. Uh, Yes, so um, let's look at the lost days in um, evaluation at the time uh, by two Swiss economists, uh, Frey and Pomerene, on the basis of Mark Blauch's Who is Who in Economics, where the most influential, about 1,000 economists, are included. And the quantitative result was that the Soviet Union lost 24 of its 36 most outstanding economies. And the successor states of the Austro-Hungarian empire lost 36 or 50 of their most influential economies and most outstanding ones. So about two thirds or more than two thirds who basically almost all ended up in the United States, a few elsewhere. And among the German speaking countries, uh, uh, the percentage of prominent economists went down from 15% among the dead to 3% of the living economists at the time. So you can see this enormous loss. Now, the other side of the coin is that Europe's loss was America's gain. It's not exactly one-to-one -one because uh, uh, who is an outstanding scholar in the one country is not automatically what, uh, an outstanding scholar in the other country. In law, for example, the positive exception is international law. But where you have very special national traditions where language matters and so on, you cannot normally move from one country to the other as a great uh, scholar. This is very difficult. On the other hand, there are some uh, emigres who fit well into the a surrounding of the hosting country. And among the Russians, those who had excellent skills in mathematics and statistics had an advantage. Also scholars from other countries uh, uh, like Horvelmo who came from Norway or Koopmans who came from the Netherlands, they were very successful in the United States as scholars. Now, uh, uh, there, among the hosting countries, the United States of America are by far the most important one. Over all sciences, among two thirds of the emigres finally ended up in the United States. The second important country is Britain, uh, but uh, then there are a few who went to Latin America, to Palestine, to Turkey, to Australia, but uh, most important is the United States. And this is reflected also in the increase of the importance of scholars in the United States. And the result in a quantitative way is that the United States gained a total of 161 outstanding economists through immigration, which accounts for about 30% of those economists born in the United States. Now there is a famous quotation by uh, a president of an American university in this period of the late 30s when uh, German emigres came to the United States. 
Hitler shook the tree and I collected the apples. <laughs> and uh, Frederick Scherer from Harvard, he made in, uh, in 2000, published in the Journal of Economic Literature, uh, examination of the social science citation index in the 1960s when the emigres were at the peak of their influence. And he came to the result that the citation received by German speaking emigre scholars were roughly equivalent to the accumulated adjusted citation of the first rank Harvard, the second rank MIT and the third university in the United States. So quite important, not negligible. And this percentage of citation of emigre scholars would substantially increase if you would include the Russians, the Italians, and other European economists who moved to the United States to, during the period of totalitarian regimes. As for example, Simon Kuznets, who probably was the first leading economist who came from the Soviet Union to the United States already in 1922, where he was a close associate of Wesley Mitchell at the National Bureau of Economic Research, Doma Grossman, Franco Modigliani, who emigrated from fascist Italy, Horvitz and Tibor Skitowski, who came from Hungary, Griewiches from Lithuania, and Koopmans from the Netherlands. And only rarely it happened that emigre scholars returned to their home country. A prominent case is Oskar Lange, who renounced his US citizenship in 1945 and returned to Poland, or Pavel Mo, who returned to Norway in 47. They were the exceptions. And if you look at the long list of emigre scholars who became presidents of the American Economic Association, it starts with Schumpeter in 48, followed by Simon Kastnitz in 54, Gottfried Haveler, Fritz Machlow, Fellner, Leontjev in 1970, Modigliani in 76, Marshak, Koopmans, Griechisch. And when the Distinguished Fellowship was introduced in 65, again, there were many uh, emigre scholars among them, Marsha Koopmans, Gerschenkron, Georgescu Rögen, Morgenstern Horwitz, Richard Musgrave, Doma, and also several development economists, such as Hirschman, Rosenstein, Rodan, and others. And uh, development economics was probably the sub area where the work of emigre scholars was most important of all sub areas in economics, in Hirschman for Latin America, for example. Yeah. Um, now we have to make a certain difference between countries and individuals. The, the impact for the countries where, which suffered from brain drain, like Germany, Austria, or Soviet Union or Russia was enormous in the long run also. Germany and Austria and even more needed a lot of time, decades after the end of the Second World War to recover and overcome the loss of intellectual potential due to uh, the brain drain. Individuals for a greater part had a very hard time also economically in emigration if they were less prominent in particular. But there are also some exceptional cases where they said that they benefited from emigration. And Richard Musgrave, he reflected on this issue that he benefited from the fact that he got his first training in economics in Germany. He got his diploma degree in Heidelberg in May 33, and immediately after, as an active social democrat and a Jew, he had to emigrate from Nazi Germany. But then he made his PhD in Harvard, and he was crossing tradition and combining uh, the continental tradition in Finanzwissenschaft, which integrated other social sciences and uh, uh, law and history with uh, Anglo-Saxon public finance, which was almost completely based in economic theory. And this was at the beginning of the development of public finance with the three well-known departments, allocation, distribution, and stabilization after the Second World War by Musgrave. So he said he benefited from the fact that he had a certain 
substantial training in two different uh, uh, traditions which he was crossing in his own work. Now, a particularly interesting case is uh, a group of Russian economists who emigrated twice, first from the Soviet Union in 1990 to Germany. The first who came in January 1990 was Jacob Marshak, and then from Nazi Germany in 1933. So uh, a, a, a second emigration due to the political circumstances. And uh, there was a whole group. You probably know when you see movies with older ones with Greta Garbo, they show you that the Russian nobility, they emigrated to Paris. But the intellectuals came to Germany for a greater part, particularly to Berlin. There was a certain second wave after 1990. In the early 1920s, up to the council reform, when the hard council was reintroduced in December 23, uh, on top more than 300,000 Russians lived in Berlin. In some areas after 1990, where Russians concentrated were called, Charlottenburg was called Charlottograd again. <laughs> so uh, there were two centers of emigration of economists of Russian origin in Germany. One in Berlin, they centered around Ladislaus from Bortkiewicz, who himself was born in St. Petersburg and uh, had an excellent mathematical and statistical training. And the second place was Heidelberg, which had a very long liberal tradition due to Karl Knies, Max Weber, and others, uh, where Emil Lederer was the center, who then in 33 became the founding dean of the university in exile of the New School for Social Research in New York. Jacob Marshak started with Bortkiewicz in Berlin and then moved uh, to Heidelberg. Bortkiewicz was the first referee of Leon Hirsch's PhD thesis, for example. But there were many other Russians like Wojtynski or Paul Baran, who became well known in the 68 student movement uh, with the book jointly written with Paul Sweezy on Monopoly Capital. And Baran did his PhD with Lederer in Berlin, for example. Now, uh, so there was a great uh, loss due to the brain drain for Russian science and the current situation probably will cause similar or is or has already caused similar difficulties. But definitely isolation is a great risk, but does not necessarily always have a negative impact if you look at certain sub areas. And particularly in mathematics and statistics, where Russia had a great tradition, you find three important exceptional cases. One is game theory. I once, to, uh, together with two Russian co-authors, uh, wrote an article on game theory in the Cold War, where you can easily show that there was a quick catching up process of Russian game theory in the Cold War after it started in the United States with the work of Morgenstern and von Neumann and others who work particularly associated with the Rand Corporation and so on. And due to Nikolai Vorotyev, Leon Petrosyan, Elena Yanoskaya or Olga Bonlareva, you had a quick catching up process and independent uh, achievements in the United States. And interestingly, there was one in a short period of opening up the famous conference in game theory in Vilnius, in Lithuania, now Baltic countries. And I think it was not by chance that this conference did not happen in the in core Russia, let's put it this way, uh, on game theory, where Oskar Morgenstern participated, but also the leading Russian scholars in game theory, and it showed how important for scholars is interaction and the exchange of ideas. And there's a great risk of falling behind if you are increasingly isolated. This does not only hold for economics, it does hold for all fields. Now, two other exceptional cases I just want to mention shortly is Eugen Slutsky, 
who made important work in the objectivation of the Paretian approach to marginal utility, which he developed in a very mathematical way two decades before the work of Hicks and Allen, when Slutsky's work became better known because originally it was more or less buried in the Italian language where it was originally published. And his second masterpiece, which became important for modern real business cycle theory, was his article on the summation of random courses as the foundation of cyclical processes. A third, there's a paper on Slutsky by Jean-Sebastien Lefant, also in the new book with Vladimir Avtonomov. And another exceptional case is the work of Leonid Kantorovich, who was a great mathematician and who applied mathematics also to certain areas like linear programming analysis. So he became also an applied mathematical economist. They stayed in the Soviet Union, but they were more or less more exceptional cases than the rule. Like I mentioned before, two thirds of the outstanding scholars in those decades emigrated from the Soviet Union. Harald, I'm really but, very yeah, sorry, but I, I'm how, how much more time do you need? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, the analysis of the past, I think has some lessons for the present, at least with regard to the importance of interaction meeting uh, of scholars at international conferences to exchange their ideas. And there you are start to suffer substantially in the moment in Russia, which probably will continue for a while as long as the conflict in the Ukraine will go on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harald, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Yes. Uh, questions, please, colleagues. Uh, yes, uh, Lissando, please. Uh, hello, Harold. Uh, hello. I, I have a, uh, well, a, a question. Uh, uh, everything is interesting and the names are always interesting. I, I would like to hear about one name that you, you, you don't mention, which is uh, related to my, to my presentation too, which is Bert Roselitz. Uh, because uh, Bert Roselitz, uh, yeah. which... which from from Austria that 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 was uh, in, in, in made his career in in in, in Chicago, uh, he he was one of the names that started with this this discussion connecting culture to development uh, and 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 he he created this 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 journal economic development and cultural change. So eventually you can you can tell us something about Bert Roselitz too and, and, and I think he originally was from Vienna. Vienna, if I remember yes, yes. Um, correctly. And he yes. was basically in Chicago later, no? And yes, yes. important in development economics, yeah. Yeah, because you mentioned this important of the Also with regard to the journal, yeah. 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 We have it not in the book because he was not of Russian origin, okay. but in, in other of the books on the German emig the German speaking emigres, we have him included. And as I mentioned, you have many others, not uh, Gershenkron was important for development economics as well. Hans Singer, Paul yeah. Streeten, and, and many others. And this is not an exceptional case. Uh, there's a famous autobiographical article uh, by Paul Streeten, who had been born as Paul Hornig in Vienna. And I think he was 21 years old when uh, the Anschluss happened, that the Nazis uh, took over uh, Austria in March 38, and he immediately as a, an active social democrat and an a, a, and a Jew, he imme emigrated immediately to England, studied in Oxford, and lived with two elderly sisters whose name was Streeton, so that he changed his name from Horny to Streeton. <laughs> and wonderful uh, biographical article which was published in the Banca Nazionale del Lavoro quarterly review. And uh, the title is Aerial Roots. Aerial Roots. So normally roots you have in the land and the ground. And he is reflecting uh, on the fact that at a time when also most Jews in France, in Italy, in Germany, also in the Second World War were nationalists and fighting for the country in which they lived in the First World War, uh, were among the first 
who in some sense were forced due to emigration to become citizens of the world and okay. took more care of those disadvantaged people in the so-called underdeveloped countries. So, uh, and it's probably also the only sub area of economics where the most important developments took place in the United Kingdom, not in America. The exceptions were a bit Hirschman and Gershenkron, but all the others like Rosenstein, Rodan, Street, the Singer, Arndt and so were placed in England where the process of other countries uh, becoming independent started with the independence of India in August 47. But so you had a high concentration also in the Commonwealth uh, uh, hub uh, in England of economists who reflected on development economics, at least in the first two or three decades that were most important. Okay. And Roselis was among them. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, you lose, please. Uh yeah. Thank you, Harald. It's so, yeah, uh, huge knowledge. Thank you very much. I would just, uh, as a footnote, mention that there was a huge number of immigrants, let's say, of Czech Republic, the Czechs at the American and English universities, who did not get such prominent positions. The most famous is Vanek from Cornell, who is not, you know, is famous in Czech Republic, but not that much. But uh, I collected in one of my work, you know, this, um, the, the stories of these people uh, on, on, in Michigan, on the on, uh, Michigan and a uh, lot of other universities, yeah. Uh, so uh, the similar situation, a little bit of the Polish uh, and Hungarian. So there was a kind of, uh, uh, intellectual, I would say, second um, uh, uh, line or, or, you know, second league of, uh, of, of immigrants who also, also, you know, did a lot of, of, the, of the research and also a lot of work at the, at the universities and thus influenced the students and the future. Yeah, so uh, less prominent, but, uh, but a large number, I, I just counted in my book, it's uh, 24 pages of uh, stories and on each page is like five, six people. So it's relatively a large number. Yeah, thank you for presentation. Did I understand correctly uh, at the beginning? You are Czech, but you are now at the Central European University in Budapest. I didn't speak about myself. I spoke about those who <laughs> who, who who ran away, the, the Czechs, yeah, Central yeah. Europeans. Because yeah. I, I I once gave some classes at the Central European University in the early nineties when oh, it was still 90, okay. located in Prague. Oh, that is correct, yeah. And not in Budapest. <laughs> and now a certain part of the administration is in Berlin and Vienna for <laughs> also political reasons, I can say. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that uh, if one compares the two countries, of course, the Hungarians were more important in economics with for Neumann, uh, uh, who was also the chief mathematician of the Manhattan Project, Kaldor, Skitowski, Horvitz, and others, or like Chillard in, in physics and so on. And many of uh, those Hungarians went to a German speaking lycée or high school in Budapest before the Nazi period, one has to say. So, uh, and Kaldor, for example, uh, studied the first year in Berlin in the mid twenties, but then he was not pleased with the tradition which was left in Berlin and uh, moved to London uh, mm -hmm. to continue his studies. Yeah, uh, uh, you have, it's different. Uh, Poland had uh, Oskar Lange and Kalecki, of course. So one was in the United States, the other in England among the prominent people. The Hungarians later had Kornai who had a greater influence and impact in Western countries with a rationing mm -hmm. approach. Uh, like uh, among the smaller countries, uh, the Netherlands were quite important due to Tinbergen on top mm -hmm. and then Koopmans, who was a student who was very influential, also as director of the Coats Commission in the US. And the Norwegians with Frisch mm -hmm. on top and the scholar, mm -hmm. uh, former student Horvelmo, also at the Coats Commission when the modern development took place in the late 1940s, very influential. Uh, among the Italians, uh, the top of the iceberg was Franco Modigliani. Uh, and uh, one has to say that the percentage of Jews who were killed and did not survive 
the fascist period was higher in Vichy France, which collaborated with the Nazi, uh, than in fascist Italy. <laughs> Mussolini discriminated them, but he did not kill them. This all only happened in the last 18 months in the Republic of Salo after he was reinstalled. But in 31, uh, there was a new law made that you had to give your oath to the Duce. And only very few uh, denied like he could do it. Marchese Vitti De Marco and one famous political scientist who ended up at the New School and Harvard later on too. But in 38, the situation became difficult with keeping your position as a Jew. But they were never attacked by the fascist system in Italy in a way the Nazis did it in Germany. But for Modigliani, it was enough not to go back to Italy, but to leave Italy and arrive in the United States just a few days before the beginning of the Second World War in 39. Thank you. Thank you, Harald. Yes, uh, Victoria, probably questions from our offline uh, colleagues. No? Uh, Victoria, are there any questions from our offline colleagues? Okay, probably I will ask uh, one more question. Yes, uh, Harald, uh, I think your presentation uh, demonstrates uh, that uh, uh, Samuelson really was right that uh, Hitler and Lenin uh, did much to US science and uh, Mm, probably my question is a bit clumsy, but just imagine uh, the world, the first half of uh, the 20th century, without these awful social experiments, totalitarian regimes, and so on and so forth. Uh, what will happen with economic science? Yes, uh, what, will uh, what will happen with continental tradition of doing economics? Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, it's very, very difficult to overcome the development of the last uh, yes. <laughs> 75 years. The second half, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, you have a great bunch of heterodox movements from evolutionary people, why historians of economic thought, uh, and even politically more right-wing people like the Austrian Americans. <laughs> <laughs> the old Austrian school from Menger and the others is not existing anymore in Austria. But due to Ludwig von Mises, who moved to the United States, you have uh, it in the United States, the more scientific uh, part at the NYU, the New York University, with Ira Kurtzner on top, uh, the more, let's say, politically radical way, even the right of the Tea Party or Donald Trump in Auburn, Alabama. Uh, uh, very politically, but they uh, also hate the mainstream, the neoclassicals. So you have a joint enemy for Marxists to the, um, to the far right, but uh, this is a mix of very different approaches with, which will not unify in something which uh, uh, can compete with the mainstream. But the mainstream part has also opened up a bit, for example, if you look at experimental economics and uh, particularly younger uh, people uh, at leading universities like Sciences Po in France or Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and other people, they started about 20 years ago to protest against education only to learn mathematics and econometrics when you want to become an economist. Uh, and uh, they started the post-autistic movement well, then the autistic people protested against the name and it's now pluralist economics or heterodox economics. And uh, among younger people, and this was enhanced by the financial crisis, which led to a worldwide great recession in 2008, 9, 10, that they got a much greater interest and reflect again what happened in the Great Depression in the early 1930s. What can we do against it, against mass unemployment, against a great uh, concentration of income and wealth in the hands of very few people? So I think uh, among the best young minds, uh, they are open at least for uh, good approaches. So there is some hope. <laughs> also, uh, the, there was a return of the master, as Kitovsky yes, who was as, a major yes. biographer of Keynes, uh, <laughs> the return of the master. So Keynesian ideas 
the role of the state in fighting against great recessions or great depressions is up on stage again. So there's some hope. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think now we have uh, practically 30 minutes. Yes, because I can't see, unfortunately, yes, uh, Professor Maliulo, yes, in our chat. Uh, so, uh, Julius, please, you're welcome. There is no time limit, practically, yes, for, for your report. No, no, yes, of course, there is a time limit. Um, um, so, um, I also will try to um, share. Yes. Maybe it works. Uh, yes, it works. Yes. Um, and um, so um, I'm happy, happy to have the presentation. I present, I prepared actually a presentation for, for this uh, seminar. So it's a little bit speculative and it's not uh, really, you know, so, um, so much work in it as was the previous uh, presentations, which were really excellent. But I would like to uh, discuss uh, generally, as if you know um, the influence of politics on the economic science or on the economics, yeah. So, uh, so uh, the structure of the talk is uh, like uh, first, um, yeah. It's uh, first we would like to say like what economics is and what economics actually is not. That would be the kind of a beginning. Then, then to point to some interrelationship between economics and politics. And then to give some examples uh, from literature, but also from my research to the end. So it is like how good economics could be a bad politics and how bad economics actually could be good politics. And, uh, and if you look around, uh, you find, uh, you know, maybe some support of the statement, but the statements are very general. So, uh, uh, and it could be objectionable, you know, I understand that. So let me then, then begin. So of course there was a, our association of the history of economic thought had a, had a book about that in 2004, yeah, which was about political events and economic ideas. So one might begin to, uh, to, to say that it was actually a pretty good book, uh, with, uh, edited by, by German economists, uh, uh, Barnes, Kaspari, and Chef and Bertrand Sheffold, and there were different papers about you know uh, the political influence on quantity theory, on European monetary integration efforts, on monetary theories generally, on different monetary reforms, on power and wealth, and politics and economics in different uh, countries and. And uh, Vladimir Autonomov have their uh, piece about uh, politics and economics in Russia, historically. So it is a great book full of observations about the interrelationship of politics, political events, and economics ideas. So, so to, put, to put, you know, as if in some contradiction or some kind of, you know, uh, contrary to each other, economic and the politics, so I structure that, so I begin like with what is economics, yeah? So of course we have a Robbins definition about and a lot of other definitions, but we can took uh, this approach now, which was uh, Harald Ulrich, uh, who is a German economist, I think living in US right now or before was in Netherlands. Ulrich uh, yeah, has uh, uh, a point which I kind of take that economics is a science also, but it's also rhetorics. And it's also ideology very strongly, especially the mainstream. And it's also art, especially in economic policy making. You know, like uh, some uh, some ministers of finance are able to stop stop hyperinflation, or some are not. Yeah, so it's difficult to understand. They use the same policies. Yeah, and the economics could be a lot of other things. Yeah, but it is science, rhetorics, and ideology, in a large extent, in this uh, presentation. But surely there is no uh, grand economic theory. Yeah, 
So, which means the grand economic theory, which would kind of like, you know, cover the economic affairs of the human kind or human society, you know, in one, as if, you know, unifying theory, we don't have such, yeah. Yeah, and politics is uh, maybe also because of that, because politics also deal with a lot of issues which are close to economical thought. Politics does is mainly absent from, uh, from economic thought. Yeah, so if I would give now some support to the three statements, economics as science, economics as rhetorics, and economics as ideology. So economics as science, that's, you know, seems like the easiest one, you know, because you, you have the description and explanation of economic phenomena, you have some tests, you have some hypotheses, you have a different uh, um, testing of whether these hypotheses are correct or not. Yeah, but again, there is no single successful approach as like uh, um, in, the, in the first presentation was, was stressed, you know, there is no, no, no single successful approach how to do economics. Yeah, so there is a mainstream, which is a very important and is a driving force, but we have a, even in, inside of mainstream, one can speak about different schools. And then plus there is a heterodox, uh, heterodoxy, you have different type of heterodoxies. Yeah, so economics is a science, surely, but we don't have a one economic theory which would uh, which we can accept as, uh, as, as to an extent some people in maybe in natural sciences can say so. Yeah, Uri himself, if I go back to his paper, says that the good theory is a beautiful. And that is the most important characteristic of theory. Yeah, so it's a, it's a beautiful and it's minimalistic, so, you know, so it uses a limited number of variables on the right hand side of the equation as if, you know, and try to explain and replicate a selected, uh, selected set of uh, key facts. So it's again, not a grand theory. Also, of course, uh, I have a feeling that economics is surely a rhetor rhetorics, is rhetorical science, yeah? Because if I go around and give a talk or other people go give a talk, we never speak about truth. So how much this reflects the reality? Yeah, this is not really of interest, uh, uh, but what is of interest, of course, is consistency of argumentation. Yeah, so the consistent way of thinking. Yeah, so which uh, which sends a signal of the of the quality of the presenter. Yeah, so consistency of argumentation and persuasive power of presentation. Yeah, so if a presentation is then heard and people remember, and uh, and it remains to some extent with them. So this is these are these are rhetorical uh, characteristics of economics. Very importantly, from the time of Ricardo and maybe even before, you know, economics is an ideology. So uh, Ricardo's statement that economics the, or political economy at that time, you know, should represent the interest of the merchant class, you know, in contradiction to interest of the landlords and interest of the of the labor, yeah. So something something like that uh, remained and it transforms uh, in, in the time. Yeah, but uh, surely uh, I see ideological even statement about positive economics of Milton Friedman in, in his 50s study that economics, you know, is, is independent of some normative judgments. Yeah, so the economic describe what is and not what ought to be. You can make a good example for it, like in a textbook level. But it seems like kind of illusory concept is rather is rather a good ideology, and not that they are they are not a worse ideologies than economics. They are also worse ideologies than economics, but economics is also an ideology as a good one. And uh, and in the book which I mentioned uh, from two thousand four in Edgar Elgar uh, about political events and economic thought, there uh, Marcello Checo, the Checo. Uh, makes this example about a Nobel Prize to Robert Merton and, and Scholz, uh, whose kind of uh, experiment then failed and was rescued by the committee led by Alan Greenspan. And he calls it kind of, or, or maybe I, I, I got this idea from him, but oh, he calls it, I don't know, but it's like, as if like chronic capitalism at its best, which is a kind of, um, uh, way of the stresses the ideological function 
of economic thought. But okay, so that is that is what economics is, and we can discuss whether these are good views. Uh, and uh, and there there is a huge pedagogical advancement in economic theory. Mainstream is very well pedagogically prepared uh, uh, from uh, elements to intermediary and to graduate. Uh, um, a retooling, which constantly happens at a very high level today. But if I now move to, to what is not economics, yeah? So I mentioned that, of course, economic theory is not built to answer everything, yeah? Of course, so nobody can beat literature. No economist can sell so many books as Gabriel Garcia Marquez, for example. Or, or somebody of similar, Jose Borges or, 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 or Tolstoy with Dostoevsky. Yeah, so, so no, economic theory is not built to answer like this kind of complexities of life. Yeah, and then we have uh, neither that, we, that people want it, but may, maybe it's not a possible uh, uh, to create a unified grand theory of society. Yeah, and that's why exist different subfields who deal with as if economic problems like anthropology and sociologists, the political scientists and others. So they, in, a, in one way or other way, they deal with similar aspects of life as economic theory is dealing, yeah? Yeah, but so consequently in economic approaches, these subfields are a lot of times missing. Even if um, uh, Professor Hageman mentioned that there, there are changes in a recent, you know, uh, developments in theory and and the, and the politi and the politics proper is as if kind of absent uh, from from the economics. Now, uh, not it, now now uh, why is why is politics not incorporate incorporated in economics? So first, one can take an elementary textbook of the 1960s, for example, with the equation y equals c plus i plus g. Yeah, and once they explain it to students that Y equals C plus I plus G, so consumption, investment, and government expenditures, then the students are, are said, said that the C has a, a function, so there's a consumption function, and I has a function, there's an investment function, but there is no function for G, and G has a bar above it telling, you know, it's something like uh, different. Yeah, so this is the first reason politics is not incorporated in the mainstream economics, which is politics is seen as a random factor, which creates unsystematic effects on economic thought or economic policy making. Okay, so that's one reason when you can defend, yeah, as if why in the economics you don't have political, political politics. There is another reason which uh, you can say is that good economics is good politics. Yeah, which uh, which I would then you know question a little bit later, but it was I think in the mainstream it is a it is a strong idea. So it is idea I would say like in the ideology of IMF, good economics is good politics, meaning good economics will relax political constraints. Political constraints are there, which lead to inefficient outcomes. And a good economics might relax these political constraints. And that's the main point of a one paper in Journal of Economic Perspective 2013 of Achemoglu Robinson, yeah? Who speak about, you know, that, um, that uh, there are forces that sometimes turn good economics into bad politics. And I will say a little bit about that, yeah? On the next slide. So when good economics makes bad politics, and then I will say about my research uh, and particular historical episode, when I would emphasize when bad economics makes good politics. So, but uh, before, when good economics made bad politics. So examples, I think maybe all three are taken from this paper of uh, Journal Economic uh, Perspective 2013. So first, let's say you have a policy to address market failure. Yeah, let's say, let's say trade union takes too much rents yeah, and which has a political consequences, and that's, you know, it has certain inefficient outcomes. Uh, now the policy makers try to, you know, weaken these rents, yeah, but then they might weaken these trade unions, which were the basis of the democracy, for example, in Scandinavia and on some other systems, and thus can tilt the balance of power in the society. So it looks like good economics, 
So you address market failure, yeah, but it could be a bad politics. And almost everything connected with distributional effects of economic policy has political consequences, and it can be explained in some cases that is there are good, you know, uh, efficiency enhancing steps which might have a, you know bad political impact. And the third one is that you know uh, you can have a politician who is who is who wants to stay in the power and thus you know removing the market failures which his regime leads to uh, can you know create a political black uh, backlash so there are this kind and there are other reasons i guess you know when good economic uh, would lead to bad politics now i have a uh, i'm working on a on a study in which i try to show example of a sl of crisis in the former Czechoslovakia. Yeah, and I studied the case study of Slovak economist responses to these crises. Yeah, and my main point will be, I will uh, finish two, three minutes. My main point will be that the bad uh, economics of the Slovak economist as compared to the advices of the Pragis economist would actually uh, led to a very good politics at the end of which was a state sovereignty uh, in Slovakia. So I take three uh, examples of three crises, 1930s, the Great Depression, 1960s, where in the socialist Czechoslovakia, first time there was a output or, or national income or net material product, as they call it that time, a collapse. So minus growth in net material product. And the third crisis was the breakup of socialism. Yeah, in all three, yeah, the Slovak economists were not cooperating with the with the leading Pragis economist. In first case, it was Karen English, then it was Ota Schick, then it was Václav Klaus. Yeah, but the Slovak response of different type of economists, the communist and not communist, yeah, uh, which was opposing uh, more predominantly mainstream policies of Prague, led to a first increasing national consciousness in Slovakia, later in transfer of Czechoslovakia to Federative Republic where Slovakia strengthened and third led to the independence of Slovakia. And then I can you know, provide uh, uh, in the in more detailed uh, analysis of it, but this is not a purpose of this presentation. Yeah, so I will just not say these two slides. So what, what was the main point of the presentation was to, to point to some tensions between economics and, and the politics uh, and, and some uh, between, you know, situation where good economics by what we understand good economics by the textbook or what we learn has a bad, bad politics lead to bad politics or even the opposite where bad economics lead to a good politics. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Julius, yes, very interesting case. Yes, uh, uh, with uh, Slovakia, yes, it's uh, really amazing. Yes, <laughs> wonderful example. Yes, but uh, uh, I have one brief question. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, you mentioned in your presentation several times uh, uh, heterodox economics. Yes, uh, uh, how do you see its future? Oh, I what see. do you think about yes uh, heterodox economic tradition traditions probably? Yeah, so you know um, there there is uh, of course already for decades people discuss what will be a future of the economic science. I remember when uh, Janusz Kornai got a honorary doctorate in Bratislava, and I was there, and the main talk was by the great. Uh, uh, Moscow uh, economist uh, Professor Polterovich. And Professor Polterovich was telling that actually it is macro which will die out, but what will remain would be game theory and econometrics. And this kind of uh, uh, technical developments would fulfill what Keynes was calling for in 1930s that economists will become dentists. 
Yeah. Will not be or plumbers, or plumbers <laughs> like Duflo, <laughs> yes, or, 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 or plumbers. Yeah, but of course there is the ideological ro role of economics, which put economists to the very high position in the societal structure. You know, Nobel Prize is some kind of a symbol of it. Even now, when they, they got Nobel Prize, the last three economists, uh, Czech economist, the former president Václav Krauss, wrote. Uh, fundamental critic of all three that they did not deserve anything, not even a Nobel Prize, yeah, because he blamed them for 2008 crisis, or partially at least, yeah. So, uh, so what's the future of, but heterodox, of course, has a lot of other faces, a lot of other faces of critical political economy uh, and, uh, and others. So actually, I, I myself don't have a clear uh, vision, but I understand that pedagogically, at all departments or most of the departments, it is the mainstream which needs to win because you prepare the students for the market and market expect the mainstream. But what it will, uh, how it could change in the future, I think it's very difficult to answer. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Julius. Yes, probably uh, some more question. Yes, uh, yes, uh, Professor Hageman, please. Yeah, I have two short remarks and one question. Um, the big mistake to give the Nobel Prize to schools and Merton, I think, was compensated. <laughs> you know, they tried to compensate it the next year in giving it to Amatia Sen, oh, yeah, who yeah. does not fit into the yeah. spectrum. I think without okay. the mistake they made with Merton and schools, Sen may not have received yeah. the Nobel Prize. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, a very and, good point. But they repeated the uh, mistake when they gave it to Eugene Farmer, because due to his main hypothesis, a big recession or depression could never start on financial markets, which are inherently stable and efficient. <laughs> but the, this they compensated a bit in the package to give it also to Robert Schiller, <laughs> yeah. who is a little <laughs> bit more open-minded. Yeah. Uh, the second okay. comment, uh, Diren Achimoglu is probably one of the most brilliant current economists. And in private compensation, he is very open-minded and uh, brings in also non-mainstream perspectives, uh, history, political Politics. science, and so on. But he would also tell you, if you want your paper being accepted by one of the top five journals, you have to deal with the questions in a highly mathematical, econometric way, and you have to redress your problems in a way that those where you have to argue with verbal style or in a more qualitative way are more or less eliminated. So if you want your paper to be accepted, you have to do a kind of preliminary or pre, uh, uh, earlier, uh, let's say, control of your own paper, which topics in which way you're dealing with. The final short question, uh, you mentioned that Ota Schick and Václav Klaus were following the mainstream approach of that time, but I think you would agree that there are some differences about among the two or not. <laughs> No, yeah, of course, but, but in the atmosphere of 60s, she was as if liberal in the socialist uh, uh, Relatively of, liberal at the time. But. Yeah, at the time in the, in the 60s, yeah. He kind of inspired the Budapest reform of 68. But not so yeah. fundamentalist, ultra-liberal as a Hayekian or Friedman. No, 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 no. I don't think he, he, not, he knew like uh, these uh, studies of... Uh, of of Hayek, actually, uh, a chic strength came that he was the maybe only one who read. So chic was uh, German was his native language, uh, and um, and so he translated Capital to Czech, and he had so in his discussions he used these liberal arguments, of what I call liberal arguments, and maybe you correct it needs a better name. He used the. Uh, uh, when attacking this ortho, uh, more orthodox uh, uh, representative of the party, he used quotation typically from Marx. Yeah, and but as a person, he was more agreeable than Klaus. On it. <laughs> well, you know, uh, so I didn't meet uh, uh, Schick uh, in person, and uh, Klaus I knew already from 1980. So, yeah, he, he's yeah, but it was a basis of his political. 
uh, you know, winning strategy. Yeah, he's kind of a straightforward uh, uh, the talk. This neoliberal things which are people very much criticizing today in the early 1990s in Prague or maybe also in Poland, they look kind of like, you know, you saved the world or something like uh, that sort. And they were kind of strong opposi opposition to the left, which Klaus vehemently represented. And that was his way, how he conquered Havel, which was the main political fight after 1990 between Havel and Klaus group. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Thank you, Harald. Yes, probably uh, one more brief question. Yes, uh, and uh, we have, yes, to close our session. Okay, uh, Victoria. Antonio probably... Mondiolo is not participating. No, no, he, he uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, I, I have no idea where he is because uh, he agreed, yes, to participate. And unfortunately, I can't find him in uh, the Zoom you see, yes, and uh, uh, no texts in messages. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, probably, yes, some technical problems, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, Victoria, probably uh, some questions, yes, uh, from uh, our offline audience, no? Uh, okay, so, uh, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank all of you for wonderful uh, presentations and very fruitful uh, debate. And uh, I think it's uh, really vital uh, in today's circumstances, yes. Uh, uh, this collaboration, yes, uh, exchange of ideas, uh, different views, yes, it's uh, really, really very important, yes, uh, for us. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm looking forward to having uh, you again uh, on our conferences, uh, and uh, mm, uh, I think your uh, insightful presentations uh, definitely uh, enriched our understanding of uh, different aspects of the history of economic thought, some methodological issues. So thank you very much. Yes, and uh, see you again on our conference. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Harold, Julius. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. How long are you staying in Göttingen, Alexander? Till mid-December. Mid-December, mid okay. So at Christmas, you are back in Britain.